All right, we talked about the technical and the data safeguards. Now we're going to talk about some human security safeguards. So how we can make the procedures and the people uh, in our information system, uh, well, put safeguards in place regarding those to keep everything safe. So human safeguards are going to be the result of authorized users following appropriate procedures. Authorized users is going to be the people side of an information system and the appropriate procedures will be the procedures side of the information system and making sure that users are authorized and procedures are appropriate and well hardened and all that kind of stuff is going to be really important here. So it requires effective authentication and user account management in order to make sure that our users are authorized and are actually acting in good faith. So there's a few safeguards that organizations can do when they're actually trying to hire employees and act, train their employees in security and all that kind of stuff. So for the employees that are already hired, uh, having very uh, well-defined position definitions is going to be really important. We're going to separate duties and authorities. So. For example, um, if an employee, if a business needs to make a purchase, the person authorizing the purchase needs to be different than the person actually making the purchase, who needs to be different than the uh, person in accounting who's actually recording the purchase and actually, you know, sending the money over and all that kind of stuff. Because if they are all the same person, then one person could start doing things like making fake purchases in order to give themselves a lot of money from the company budget. So you want to separate the duties and authorities. You want to separate the person who has the authority to make something happen from the person who is actually doing something. It actually also helps uh, provide accountability and some amount of checks and balances there. You also want to give the least possible privilege so every employee should not be given more authority than they need in order to do their job. Uh, an employee in marketing may not need to see all of the data regarding the customer. They may not need to see the customer's billing information or stuff like that. Giving them the least possible privilege would give them access to only the data that is required for them to do their job if they even need to do marketing based on the billing address of the uh, actual uh, you know, customer or client or whatever that they're working with, maybe they just only need the city name so they can make references to the city for that marketing thing. So they wouldn't even need the whole uh, billing address. City itself might just be fine. And then you want to document the position sensitivity of every um, employees. So you want to make sure that it's uh, actually written down who has what um, abilities and uh, privileges in terms of security and access and all that kind of stuff that is really important there. There's the hiring and screening process. You want to evaluate any possible employee who you might hire in order to make sure that they are who they say they are, that they are trustworthy. Um, they weren't lying about their possible references or anything like that. You want to screen them to get the best idea possible if they are trustworthy. And for a high sensitivity position, like something in healthcare or education or government or financial or something like that, this might even involve checking in with different databases, like requesting data from the FBI or something like that. So again, it's the whole thing of uh, risk management versus cost. Um, if things are low stakes, you might not need to go super in depth, but if you have, uh, if you're hiring for a position that is working with very privileged information, you might want to uh, do a lot of screening. And then in new employee training, you have to uh, actually disseminate all the security information because an employee won't know what they are supposed to do if they're not actually told. So this dissemination and enforcement is all about telling an employee what their responsibilities are with regards to security and then actually enforcing it if they mess something up. So it's 
uh, talking about the responsibility that an employee has, the, the responsibility for um, contributing to the security and doing their job and all that kind of stuff. Um, employees should be able to be held accountable for their actions by design of the security program. So if an employee does something bad, there should be accountability. There should be a way to see who did the bad thing. Oh, it was this employee. And then they can discipline that employee. So let's say if you're making changes to a database or something like that, there should be a log of who actually made changes to that database. And then if that change ended up being bad, someone can look back and see, okay, well, this change was made by this person. So now we can hold them accountable. Uh, and then it should encourage compliance. Uh, employees should, you know, there should be check-ins to make sure that an employee is complying with the security procedures, especially with a um, high sensitivity position. Now, when it comes to termination, uh, this can be a little tricky, especially if, um, you know, this, you're trying to terminate an employee who is able to work with very high sensitivity data because an unfriendly termination could possibly motivate that employee to do something malicious before they leave, like change a whole bunch of data and erase all the backups so that nothing could possibly be restored or something like that. So trying to take the steps in order to properly terminate employees in order to avoid some sort of collateral damage or something like that, such as uh, giving system administrators advance notice so they can be on the lookout and also be ready to deactivate employee accounts or something like that could be necessary. Um, there should be steps taken to possibly um, to possibly prevent some sort of malicious uh, activity if you're terminating someone. Now, it may be the case that you have to open up an information system to a non-employee personnel if you need to hire a vendor or temp person or someone who works for a partner company or something like that. You might need to give them temporary access to certain areas and then be ready to revoke that access when they're gone. But um, you will work out a contract in order to figure out how exactly that temporary personnel is going to get access. So it's going to include appropriate security measures. You're going to include screening and security training that might be necessary and any specific security responsibility for that temporary personnel. Uh, sort of like you would with a regular employee, but you know, making sure that even though they're temporary and they might not be there for long, they still need to know all this stuff to uh, prevent human error or try to weed out any possible malicious intent. And of course, you provide least privilege possible in the accounts associated with temporary workers and terminate immediately when they are done. We talked about this before. You want to harden any public facing information systems because non-employee personnel could also include people who don't work in your company, could be uh, customers or just random people, uh, and they might try to take advantage of any sort of security weaknesses. For example, testing to see if your website is vulnerable to SQL injections. So you want to harden your public facing information systems, uh, sanitize user inputs, make sure that people can't take advantage of any weaknesses that they might see. Also, some users are going to rely on public facing info information system related services. So for example, we rely on Microsoft Outlook for all of our email communication. So Microsoft has to protect all of us from any internal security issues. If something bad happens in Microsoft, um, they need to make sure that they're doing their best to allow us to still use Outlook without something being compromised, whether it's the actual service itself, meaning that we can't send emails anymore, or whether it's uh, the data that we are sending to each other through OneDrive or email attachments or whatever. Um, so that is really important as well. Those, those safeguards need to be in place, both to protect 
the inside from the out and the outside from the in. Now for account administration, this is going to come in three forms right here. Uh, we have the account management, which is the actual creation and deletion of accounts. So create new accounts for new people, set all the permissions for those people appropriately, and uh, make sure that those accounts have the access that they need and are doing the right things. And then deleting it as soon as it's no longer necessary. If, a, if an employee uh, quits or is fired or retires or whatever, um, that account has to be no longer active. Also things like changing the permissions as a person moves around in the company. They might have new access to things they didn't have before. They might lose access to things that they once had based on their new job description. So it's important to make sure that those permissions get updated in a timely manner to prevent any unauthorized access or prevent work from not being able to happen. Uh, we also have password management. This will talk about things like the creation of an initial password for a new user account, but then also having them change their password as soon as possible. Make sure that the password that they change to is strong. And then also um, make sure that they are changing their passwords frequently, uh, maybe as frequently as three months or so, maybe even more frequently, um, which can be annoying for some users, but it's important to make sure that uh, passwords change frequently in order to avoid potential compromise. And then there's help desk policies and procedures as well. Um, making sure that uh, help desk isn't going to get, say, social engineered into providing access to someone malicious. So they have to authenticate users or something like that, anyone who is calling down to get technical assistance from the help desk. So the procedures in place to uh, actually make sure that uh, users are authenticated before help is being given. Uh, this might be things like asking um, information, security information that only the user should know, or for a PIN or an email or something like that. Now, every information system should have different types of procedures that govern different um, you know, needs or functionalities or stuff like that. Every information system should have uh, procedures for normal operation, backup, and recovery of data. Um, there should also be separate procedures for users of a system and the operations personnel, the people who actually keep things running in the background. So for example, the normal under normal operation, system users will have procedures that involve using the systems to perform job tasks with appropriate security. Operations personnel will have uh, operation in terms or operation procedures in terms of uh, operating the equipment, managing the network, running web servers, all the day-to-day -day operational tasks that keep everything running. When it comes time to backup, system users will have procedures involving essentially just preparing for the loss of system functionality. So they'll be given a heads up and they, at a certain point, will stop their work, save everything, make sure they're not actively modifying things that will be broken or lost, and then just wait for that system functionality to go down while everything is being backed up. Operations personnel during a backup period are going to back up all the website resources, databases, administrative data, account, uh, account and password data, and other data. And then for recovery, uh, accomplished job tasks during some sort of failure, uh, the, there is likely a list of tasks of what you need to do during system recovery, but while system recovery is happening, uh, just keep on working. Don't sit around doing nothing. The operations personnel will be putting out fires, essentially, uh, recovering systems from backing up data, performing the role of help desk during recovery to try to recover any lost work or try to help with any damaged machines. And then for uh, human safeguards, we also have security monitoring, which uh, is all about uh, keeping an eye on people and making sure everything is going the way it should be. So for example, log analyses 
Um, a lot of information systems will produce activity logs when it comes to any operations that people are doing with them. So accessing the network will produce some sort of activity log. Making changes to databases will also probably produce an activity log, all that kind of stuff. So periodically monitoring these activity logs to see if there's anything kind of suspicious. Uh, if there's network traffic going out to weird areas, if there's weird changes being made from weird sources uh, within the building to databases, all that kind of stuff. Just checking in and seeing what's going on with the logs can be a really important part of monitoring for security. There's also security testing. Uh, this is a really fun one. You uh, actually try to test the veracity of your security systems, whether that's physical and digital, as well as the employee procedures. Um, there might be applications that do that kind of work for you especially to test out security vulnerabilities and that kind of stuff. Um, there might be internal investigations through use of things like honeypots, which allow a company, it's a very tempting looking piece of data that's very easily accessible that a uh, enterprising hacker might break into a network and see, ooh, this looks fun. I'm going to take, I'm going to take a look at this data. And they reach into the honeypot and it, somehow it logs, hey, Someone looked at me, so there's probably a hacker here. It gives that uh, notification to the IT team or you know whatever security team, and they know that someone has broken in almost immediately. Uh, it's known as a honeypot specifically because of the analogy of leaving honey out and then flies getting stuck in that honey. They're tempted by the sweetness of it, but then they get stuck. Uh, they've been, and uh, that's kind of what goes on when a hacker encounters a honeypot is they get identified and caught essentially or at least there's a notification that someone was there there's also something called pen testing or penetration testing where teams of people will actually go and pretend like they are trying to gain access to a company so they're hired by a company to test that company's security but the person who hires them doesn't tell anyone else in the company. So no one else has any idea who these people are. So they might try to do something like get hired by the company. They might come in as a new hire in a particular department and try to see where they can get into from there, exploiting uh, vulnerabilities and procedures and people. Or they might try to physically break into a building and try to get data after hours or something like that, see if there's any way for them to get as much data as possible, sniff network traffic, all that kind of stuff. It's fascinating work. Uh, actual on-site penetration testing is wild. Um, and then there's learning from security incidents. So you try to look at what went wrong, especially by reviewing logs or reviewing uh, things that happened in uh, like changes that were made or the the fallout of any sort of security incident you clean everything up which we'll talk about in the next video and then you say okay well how were they able to get in what kind of stuff were they able to do and why were they able to do it why did they why were they able to access this data or make these changes to the data uh why were they able to get hired or why were they able to install this program or why did our malware program not install this program? Like all that kind of stuff. You interrogate the situation and what happened and you um, learn from it and you move on. That's all the human security safeguards. In the next video, we'll be talking about how to actually respond to a security incident if and when it happens.